All right. Well, time for another lecture about physics. Hopefully that's why you're here. That's why I'm here. Um, and this lecture is going to be about uh, the concept of momentum. In the past couple of lectures, we talked about Newton's laws of motion, uh, his three laws of motion, and particularly thinking back on his second law of motion uh, relating how force applied to a mass causes an acceleration, and how if you apply a larger force, you get a larger acceleration. If you apply the same force to a larger mass, you get a smaller acceleration. All right, so that's kind of summarizes Newton's second law. Um, and it turns out that um, within Newton's second law, in a way, there's a, uh, this other sort of concept, or this other quantity that comes out, um, which we call momentum. And yeah, that's what today's lecture is going to be all about. Um, and in the end, uh, momentum is a very useful concept in a number of different ways, but by and large in uh, physics, it is very useful when it comes to analyzing collisions. So like what happens when one object hits another. Generally speaking, uh, momentum is something you would call, or that is sometimes called a quality of motion. Meaning that it's a, a thing or a property that an object has due to the fact that it's in motion. So if an object uh, is moving, it has a momentum. Right? Or if it has momentum, it's moving. Yeah, a number of different ways to state that. So yeah, so why is momentum a useful thing? Well, like I said, um, it actually comes out of Newton's second law, uh, quantitatively comes out of the second law, um, but it, in fact it's also a pretty relatable sort of quality too, or quantity even. Whereas when we talked about, you know, uh, the force you would apply to an object, or how uh, the acceleration object, or the speed of an object, all those things uh, tell you something about how the object's moving or is going to move, but momentum can be even more useful in that it's a quantity that you can kind of say is, uh, well, just from the momentum of an object itself, it kind of tells you a good bit about that object, and particularly whether or not you should be worried about that object. So momentum is something that incorporates both mass and velocity, so two things we've talked about already. And essentially, if anything has a large amount of momentum, then you got to be aware of it, watch out for it. Right. So it has to do with mass and velocity, right? In uh, particularly, or more exactly, momentum is the momentum of an object is proportional to its mass, meaning if it has a greater mass, then that object can have a greater momentum. The momentum of an object is also proportional to its velocity. Again, meaning if it has a greater velocity, it will have a greater momentum. If it has a lower velocity, lower momentum. And it turns out the momentum is only made up of those two things. So momentum is explicitly, as a mathematical relationship, is equal to the mass of an object multiplied by its velocity. And I didn't have it on here specifically, but um, mo uh, momentum is another thing that is a vector quantity, meaning that it has an amount, a certain magnitude to it, and it's pointing in a particular direction. I think that might come up later in this lecture, actually, too. But the uh, direction... The amount is essentially just the mass, whatever amount of mass that's by the amount of velocity, or the speed of the object. The direction is going to be the direction of the velocity of the object. So momentum is in the same direction the object is moving, essentially. Given that momentum is proportional to both mass and velocity, you can have large amounts of momentum in different ways. For instance, a super tanker, up, on, up here, not moving very quickly, but an incredibly large mass a huge amount of mass there, right? So even though the velocity is not very large, the mass of that object is huge, and so the momentum of it is huge, right? You don't want to get in the way of a super tanker. Uh, similarly, a bullet, um, in this case, is a very small mass, a little thing, but it has an, a very large velocity, very high uh, velocity. So a bullet is also something that will have a large amount of momentum, and again, don't want to get in the way of bullets. So momentum in that way is a quantity that's more relatable in a, um, I guess, an easily relatable sort of quantity in that if something has a larger amount of momentum, it is in some sense uh, could be dangerous. Right? If it has a sm very small amount of momentum, you know, you know, maybe you don't necessarily need to worry about that much. So another example, if you have a boulder and 
a stone or a pebble even, and they're rolling at the same speed, or they have the same, they're going in the same direction, they have the same velocity, the boulder has a much greater mass, and so it has a much greater momentum, and which is one way of understanding why the boulder is the much more dangerous object in that situation. And beyond that, the same boulder, if it was moving even faster, you know, you increase the velocity of the object, you're increasing the momentum of the object, it's even greater momentum overall, it's even, uh, well, more worrisome in a way. And finally, we need to point out that a boulder at rest or anything at rest uh, doesn't have any momentum, right? Since momentum is made up of mass multiplied by velocity, if the object is at rest, it has zero velocity, meaning multiplying zero by whatever mass, you're gonna get zero momentum. All right, so now a uh, quick check for yourself. If we take these two uh, objects, now we're talking about some cars. You have a two-ton car, it's going 60 miles per hour, and, um, well, then there's also a five-ton truck, and it's going at 20 miles an hour. Which of those vehicles has a greater momentum? And then, well, you can answer the, read the second question yourself, too. All right, so go ahead and hit pause, try to answer these questions, and we'll look at the answers in a second. Okay, well, we know the mass and the velocity, or the speed at least. Uh, we can calculate the amount of the momentum of each of these objects. So the car is 2 tons times 60 miles per hour, mass times velocity. Um, we're not concerned with the direction as much right now, so we're really just talking about the magnitude, the, so the mass times the speed is good enough. Um, but that would be 120 ton miles per hour, or ton miles per hour, a strange unit, um, but we're not so worried about the units because they're going to be the same, so we can just compare the numbers. Okay. So 120 ton meter uh, miles per hour versus the truck, which is 5 tons times 20 miles per hour is 100, or 100 ton miles per hour. So there you go, the car has the greater momentum, even though it's much smaller. Right, so the car's uh, momentum is greater, what would the car's speed have to be in order for the momentum to be the same? Well, we don't need to worry too much about, you know, or hopefully it's not too difficult of a math, uh, mathematical step to write down this equation where you know the mass, you know the um, momentum that you want it to be, that uh, you want to have the same uh, momentum as the truck. So the two tons of the car multiplied by whatever velocity, we know we want to be 100 ton miles per hour. So just dividing by two tells us that the car's speed should be 50 miles per hour, and then each of them would have the same amount of momentum. So how does momentum uh, relate to force then? Right, I told you uh, momentum kind of comes out of Newton's second law, so it definitely has to do with force. Well, it turns out that if you want to stop an object that has a large amount of momentum, right? Think that super tanker or the bullet. Um, you need to apply a force in order to stop it, right? Because you're going to change its velocity. You need to accelerate some way. So Newton's second law says apply a force. You can uh, accelerate or decelerate an object. You can change its velocity. So you need to apply a force. And if something has a large amount of momentum, you're either going to need to apply a very large amount of force over a short period of time or a small amount of force over a long period of time. You know, just considering something like, uh, you know, trying to stop a bullet, well, either you have like a steel plate in the way and that steel plate is very quickly going to stop the bullet because it's uh, going to exert a whole lot of force back on the bullet as it hits it. Or you might have like a tank of water or ballistics gel or some kind of a thing like that where it's not applying as much force, but it, so it needs to apply for a longer amount of time and that bullet keeps moving for a while before it stops. So large force over a uh, short time or a short, small amount of force over a long time. It turns out that changing object momentum requires force and it involves a certain time interval. The force needs to apply, be applied over a certain time or for a certain amount of time. So it turns out that force applied for a certain time, or over a certain amount of time, is what we call an impulse. An impulse is exactly equal to a force multiplied by the time that that force is applied for. Force on an object multiplied by the time interval, or the amount of time the force acts on the objects. 
So I was trying, just trying to keep these uh, terms straight or these things straight. So momentum is a quality of an object, remember? So it's something that an object has because it's in motion. An impulse is much more like a force in itself in that it's something that acts on an object. It's essentially, it is basically a force, but it's force applied over time. All right, so if you then kind of just look at each of those sides a little, in a little more detail, right, on the one hand you have uh, impulse, and that impulse is just a force applied over a certain amount of time, so force multiplied by that time interval, however long it was. Um, and on the other side, we have that change of momentum. So uh, for our purposes, we're only really going to think about changing an object's velocity to change its momentum. So the mass of an object um, is not really going to change in our kind of what's the uh, circumstances or the situations we're thinking about for the most part, or by and large. For instance, when the bullet hits the steel plate and comes to a stop, it didn't lose any of its mass. It didn't evaporate into thin air or something like that. Um, the way it changed in momentum was its velocity went from some velocity to zero velocity. So it went from some amount of momentum, that velocity times the mass, to zero momentum. Zero velocity times the mass, zero momentum. So for the most part, change in momentum, we're talking change an object's velocity. And so this is sort of uh, where, in a way, the relationship between uh, momentum, the concept of momentum, and Newton's uh, second law comes in, because it turns out that uh, um, you can actually rearrange this bottom equation and uh, change in velocity and uh, this time interval combine in order to give you acceleration. So this is another statement of Newton's second law, actually. Okay, so as um, a demonstration of impulse, um, essentially uh, how you change an object's momentum um, and the different sort of ways and outcomes of, well, you change the momentum by applying an impulse, but you can apply an, an impulse in different ways, right? Because impulse is made up of force and time interval. So you can apply a large force over a short time or a small force over a large time, longer time. So in this example, um, we're going to see somebody throw an egg, raw egg, at a sheet or a plastic sheet or a bed sheet. So something that's held loosely and kind of allowed to dangle a bit. Um, and in that way, when the egg hits the sheet, um, the sheet's not sort of taut and uh, can actually give a bit. So you can think for yourself for a second of what's going to happen when the egg hits the sheet. But take a look. So people are throwing the eggs as hard as they can, the eggs don't break. I think it's like a military academy where this is happening or something. Um, but yeah, there you go. That's a good shot. Well, so what's going on here, right? Because we're the eggs are definitely uh, starting out. You know, somebody's they're throwing the eggs, so they're giving them some velocity. The eggs have mass, so they have some momentum, and so. The sheet is what it's going to apply an impulse in order to change the momentum. But since the sheet is kind of dangled, um, it can apply a force to stop that egg, but it can apply it for a longer period of time because the sheet gives, and so it, it uh, presents some resistance, right? Newton's third law is going back to the egg hits the sheet and the sheet hits back on the egg. But due to the fact that it can keep moving, it gives, and it doesn't have to apply as much force, or it can apply a smaller force over a longer time. So then some questions about this uh, egg throwing at a sheet, and then also, uh, if you don't uh, remember or can't imagine what happens if you throw an egg at just a wall, um, you get a whole different effect. Um, but the same idea, or the same thing happens, you do a, the wall applies an impulse. There's a number of questions about these two different situations. If you throw an egg at a uh, sheet hanging loose, or you throw an egg at um, a wall, uh, right, right? Which one has the greater velocity? Which one has the greater momentum? The largest impulse, longest, largest time impact, and largest force on the egg. So take a second, uh, hit pause, and try to give a quick answer to each of these little questions here. Uh, right, so before we see the answers here, or at least my answers, uh, let's take a look at what happens to each of them. I kind of already know what happens to one of them, hopefully. 
And here you go, the egg thrown at the wall, splat. Yep, just like you would think. Egg thrown at the loose sheet, no splat. Okay, so what's going on? Right. So assuming that that guy in the picture, or in the film, and in these situations too, assuming you're throwing the egg with the same, uh, giving it the same uh, uh, momentum when you throw it, meaning you they have both these eggs have the same mass, and you're releasing them at the same speed, um, that they each have the same mass, they each have the same velocity, then they both have uh, the same momentum. And I think I just took a rough, like, average, if you throw an egg pretty hard, you throw an object like a baseball pretty hard, you might throw it about 40 miles, 45 miles an hour. Which has a greater change of momentum? Well, again, if they both start out with the same momentum, some amount, we don't know exactly what it is, but it's something, and they're both the same, and in the end, they're both stopped, right? So if they're both at rest, they each have no momentum, so the change is the same as well. You start with the same amount, you end with the same amount, the change has to be the same as well. So which one applies the larger impulse, or which has a larger impulse applied to it? Well, again, if the change of momentum is the same, the change of momentum is equal to the impulse applied. So the impulses out are also the same. Right? So we got same, same, same. So what's different here? Right? Which has the larger or the longer time of impact? That's the sheet. So in the sheet's case, they have a, like a big T here for the time that the egg is impacting. Long time, sm uh, small amount of force. Which has the larger force on the egg? That's going to be the wall, right? Very short impact time means the same impulse. If you have a shorter time period to apply that, where that impulse is being applied for, that means the force that's being applied is much larger. And in the end, essentially, it's the force is the destructive thing. So in the case where you're stopping each of these eggs, they start with the same momentum, they end with the same momentum, they change their momentum the same amount. The difference is, in this case, we apply the impulse in such a way where the force is very small and the time is very long or longer. And the other case, the force is very large and the time is very short. So if you haven't deduced this on your own, there's some takeaways are essentially that um, well, if you want to change your object's momentum, that's going to require uh, you to apply an impulse or something to apply an impulse to that object. And, well, if you want to be as gentle on the object as possible, as, uh, then you, well, you're still going to need to apply the same overall impulse, but if you apply, uh, if you sort of stretch the time length for that impulse, that means that the force you have to apply is much less. That means that it's just less detrimental on the object overall. So some very uh, relatable, um, I guess, examples or ways where this idea of impulse and changing momentum comes into play is in uh, automobile safety. Right? So when a car crash happens, essentially there are a number of safety mechanisms that are built into cars to maximize or extend the time of the impact. Right? And by extending the time of the impact, the, your momentum has to change from whatever it is to zero. So if you make the time that that impact occurs longer, the amount of force that's going to be applied to you in that impact um, can be less. Less force, then you'll have less damage to yourself overall. Right? So like airbags um, are essentially, you know, they just these balloon sort of thing that inflates out, and instead of you smashing into the uh, steering wheel of the car, uh, you hit the airbag and it gives a bit. It does the same sort of thing as that uh, bed sheet, the sheet the egg was thrown at. It gives and you'll extend the amount of time that you are changing your momentum from whatever amount it is to zero. Um, and similarly, there are things called crumple zones that are is explicitly designed into a car so that uh, pieces of the car, instead of being rigid, so that when they hit something, uh, they just, well, they don't do anything, they just stay like they are. Um, instead of doing that, they're meant to crumple in, and it takes, uh, extends the time of the impact as the um, piece of the car crumples in. And again, you extend the time, you can do, uh, you decrease the amount of force it's going to take to uh, change their car's momentum, to change your momentum. So that sort of brings us to what I said was one of the main reasons that momentum is a useful sort of thing, is in collisions. Right? And we kind of already been talking about collisions, like the egg, and the sheet and the wall, the egg and the sheet and the egg and the wall, 
Now that's a collision. Um, it's one object colliding with another object. Um, the automobile uh, hitting a wall, another kind of collision. But well, you might already see now why this uh, concept of momentum and also in terms of uh, impulse is very uh, useful when thinking about when uh, what happens when one object hits another. So if you have two objects and they're going to collide, it turns out, well, you can be able to imagine or uh, deduce that the impulse on each of these objects is essentially equal and opposite, meaning that it's the same amount of the impulse and it's just uh, directed in the opposite direction. So it turns out impulse is also a vector quantity and it goes with the direction of the force in that case. Um, and in the case of a uh, collision, right, where you have two objects that are coming towards each other, hit each other, and in this case sort of bounce off and go off and go backwards. Right? So the only things that are coming into play in terms of this collision is, well, there's a time of impact, there's the amount of time that they're hitting each other, and there's no way that those two are going to be different. It's just the same. There's one amount of time that they're in contact. And according to Newton's uh, third law, the amount of force that one object applies to another is equal and opposite to the force that's being applied to it. Right? So one ball hits that ball with a certain amount of force in that direction. The other ball is pushing in the same amount of force in the opposite direction of the other ball. So if we have the same amount of time, the same amount of force, the impulse, those two things will apply together, the impulse. Right? So the impulse on these two objects is the same, meaning that the amount that these objects are going to change their momentum is also the same, right? Because impulse applied to an object is just equal to the change in an object's momentum. And the final sort of step is, well, for the most part, like I said, we're not worried about when an object changes its mass, and also, in a way, we're not really thinking that much about changing objects' direction, because you can also change velocity that way. But, um, well, I guess that's not true. These are objects are changing direction. They're coming in and they're coming back out. So really, when we're talking about changing momentum, we're talking about changing its velocity, meaning in this case, basically most, or mostly just the direction that these objects are moving. So they're coming in with certain velocities. They uh, collide, they apply the equal and opposite impulses to each other, and they change each other's momentum in the exact same amounts. Yeah. So if the objects have the same uh, mass, if they're equal in mass, well, and then, and in a collision, their change in momentum is the same. Same mass, same change in momentum means the same change in velocity, right? So that was gonna tell us that if you have two equal mass objects coming in uh, at the same speed, they're gonna collide and move backwards exactly at that same speed, just in the opposite direction. When their masses are unequal, it comes a little bit, uh, a little bit trickier, but um, the concept of momentum and mathematically, or specifically mathematically, momentum is very useful in figuring out what these objects are going to do afterwards, namely which way they're going to be moving and how fast they're going to be moving. One other sort of main concept about momentum, or having to do with momentum, and is what's known as a conservation law. So, and particularly the conservation of momentum. So, in physics and maybe elsewhere, there are a number of th laws that we call conservation laws. And the simplest way to understand what it means to say something is conserved, or there's a conservation law about that thing, is just to say that at one particular time, you have a certain amount of something. It's conserved, meaning at a later time, you have that same amount of something. So in the terms of momentum, if you start out with a certain amount of momentum, either with one object or with multiple objects you're considering together. Um, you start out with a certain amount of momentum, at a later period of time, you're still going to have the same amount of momentum. So that is in the case where this, whatever you're considering, whatever you're looking at, whether it's one object, two objects, three objects, as long as there's no external things coming in to uh, mess up with this system, essentially. So as long as you don't have any external forces coming in, then the momentum of that system that you're looking at is going to stay constant. It's going to be conserved from one time to the next. Um, so an example of that conservation of momentum is uh, firing a cannon or a gun. And let's look a little more closely at that. If you look at the, the system or the combination of the cannonball and the cannon, 
Well, before the cannons fired, the that system has no momentum. There's each of those things has mass. The cannonball has mass. The cannon itself has mass, but neither of them are moving. They're both at rest, so neither of them have any momentum. Okay, so this is all to say then that that system entirely has no momentum. So as long as nothing external is going to come along to mess with that, the system needs to still have zero momentum. It's going to be conserved at zero overall. But that doesn't mean things can't move. Right? So what happens is essentially if you then fire that cannon, right? you have your cannon here, fire the cannonball, well, it should be pretty obvious, or hopefully obvious now, that that cannonball has momentum now. Right? It has a mass, it's moving in that direction at a certain speed, or a certain velocity in that direction, it has momentum. Right? What does that mean? Well, in order for the momentum to be conserved, that means the cannon has to move in the opposite direction. Right? It has to gain some momentum in the opposite direction, and the same amount of momentum actually as the cannonball has in that direction. So you have cannonball going one way, you have the cannon recoiling uh, in the opposite direction. And uh, it turns out that, well, since the momentum of the system is conserved overall, the amount of momentum going this way is the same as the amount of momentum going that way. The reason that the cannon doesn't fly out in that direction is because the cannon is much larger, has a, a lot more mass, right? So with a lot more mass, um, it can have a much smaller sort of, uh, a much smaller velocity and still have the same amount of momentum as the cannonball did. You know, you also probably recognize that those things don't keep moving, Right? So the momentum doesn't appear to be conserved anymore, but the, the reason for that is that there are external forces acting there. Right, Like the cannon is recoiling, but it's dragging against the ground, or it's being uh, restrained by ropes or something like that. Right? So there are external forces that are uh, um, actually applying impulses to that cannon to stop its momentum, or to stop it from continuing to move. And then, sort of bringing that back to uh, talking about collisions, right? It's in some ways it's uh, this different ways of saying the same things. When we were saying that um, uh, in a collision you have uh, equal impulses being applied, equal, equal if, uh, amount in opposite directions, meaning that the change in momentum in each object is the same. So, in a way, that's also another way of stating that uh, momentum will be conserved in this situation, right? Because is whatever amount one changes, it's the same in the opposite direction for the other one. So essentially in collisions, whatever momentum is gained by one object or however one object's momentum has changed, the other object's momentum um, has sort of lost that, or lost that amount of momentum or has changed in the opposite way. So in a sort of a mathematical notation, you could write, um, Say on the left, we have object A and object B, and they're coming in towards each other, right? They both have mass, they're both moving. So they both have a certain amount of momentum. And you can say object A has A momentum, or, mom or momentum A, and object B has momentum B. And if you add those two amounts together, it's a little tricky because it needs to be, they're vectors, so we're not worrying about too much about the math, but. It's not quite always as simple as just adding two numbers together. Um, we don't need to worry about that, that so much. Just the fact that you add object A's momentum and object B's momentum together beforehand, that's the total momentum before the collision. The conservation momentum says that after the collision, object A's momentum will have changed. So it's a new thing. Object B's momentum will have changed. But again, if you add them together, you get the same amount. So, in a very simplified way, if not worrying about units or vectors or anything like that, if you object momentum or object A started out with five momentum and object B started out with ten momentum, then whatever the after the collision happened, the sum of object A and object B would have to be fifteen still. Right? Because add five and ten to begin with, you get fifteen. Afterwards, you still gotta get fifteen. Right? That's the idea of conservation momentum. Whatever um, well, momentum is there to begin with needs to be the same later on. The exact way the momentum will change uh, depends on details 
and also whether or not um, these collisions are what we call elastic or inelastic. Um, so we're going to look at a couple of examples uh, to finish up this lecture of different kinds of collisions. So first, what we call an elastic collision. Um, you don't need to worry too much about these terms, elastic versus inelastic, are, you could at least think, are meant to uh, indicate opposites in a way. And beyond that, they're actually stating opposite ends of like a spectrum of kinds of collisions. So like one end of the spectrum of collisions, we have elastic or sometimes even called perfectly elastic collisions. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have inelastic or again, sometimes called perfectly inelastic collisions. But there's a kind of a spectrum in between. So for our purposes, we're just going to think about them as being two, two things, look at one end, look at the other end. Right, so only the simplest kind of uh, pictures or uh, possibilities. So in the elastic case, it basically just want to think about like billiard balls colliding. So for elastic collisions, it's usually like rigid objects that hit and separate. So yeah, so just like you're ever playing pool, um, you hit the cue ball, the cue ball hits another ball, and that ball uh, gets knocked off somewhere, the cue ball goes off to another place, right? That is a very good example of an elastic collision. And as it turns out, um, we'll talk more uh, in the next part of the course about atoms and what makes up matter, makes up all of us. Um, it turns out that atoms in a gas are, in a lot of ways, or in a, on a fairly accurate level, can just be thought of as like billiard balls. So they're very much like elastic collisions. All the stuff in the, makes up the air is essentially like billiard balls knocking around out there. These sort of three cases, um, I think I have videos, or at least the first two, are these kinds of elastic collisions. And say the first one, you have one uh, billiard ball or one object, and it's sitting at rest. And then you have another one moving, uh, coming along and uh, moving at it, right? So again, we're thinking about this in terms of the momentum of these objects, and beyond that, the momentum of the combination of the objects because before and after the collision that momentum that total momentum should be the same because the momentum is conserved we say it's conserved so if we have one object at rest no momentum right the yellow the yellow ball here right sitting at rest then we have this green ball coming along a, a has some velocity right so it has some uh they're each massive so it has some mass has some velocity um, has momentum. It's going to collide with this object, and I believe in this case there are, all these objects are the same mass, amount of mass, but I guess it's not too important. But anyway, the object, that green object comes in, hits the uh, uh, yellow object, and afterwards the green object is at rest. That means it has no momentum. All of its momentum will be transferred to the yellow object. So this will happen when you have elastic collisions of two objects where one's at rest and one's in motion. And in the second case, if you have two uh, objects and they collide elastically, but they're both in motion and they're both coming at each other, then what's going to happen is they'll, they're going to come in, they're going to collide, they're going to um, apply an equal and opposite impulse on each other. Right? They're going to change each other's momentum by the same amount. So that means essentially they're just going to sort of exchange momentum in a way and move off back excuse me, in the opposite direction. And if they're the same mass, it's fairly simple because it's, they recoil with the same mass as this came in with. And uh, this final situation, which I don't know if I have a nice video for, but essentially if you have two objects and they collide elastically, but one's moving slowly and one's moving quickly um, in the same direction, then the quicker ones, well, I guess on this side, the quicker one, the green one here, is going to catch up and it's going to collide with that slower one and it's going to transfer some of its momentum to that slower one. So after the collision, that uh, green uh, ball will now be moving slower, and the yellow ball will now be moving faster. But the point is, in each of these situations, if you sort of imagine kind of adding up the arrows or combining these arrows, because these arrows are essentially vectors representing the momentum of these objects, before the collision and after the collision, the arrows add up to be the same. Right? So in case A, there's that momentum going to the uh, right before the collision, after the collision, same amount of momentum going to the right. In collision B, 
we have two arrows, equal and opposite, coming at each other, so that's zero momentum before the collision. And afterwards, again, arrow to the left, arrow to the right, same amount, opposite directions, add up to zero still, right? So zero before, zero after. And here, in the final one, there's a certain amount of momentum, and then there's a smaller amount of momentum, but then afterwards, there's a smaller amount of momentum, and then a larger amount of momentum. So again, the, the momentum has transferred, essentially, sort of transferred away from one object to another, but the net amount is still the same. The total is still the same. All right, so he's going to... It's going to be with one object at rest, and the other object hits it, right? So the first object that was moving, we had an elastic collision, and all the momentum was transferred to the second object, and the first object comes to a uh, standstill, right? It comes to be at rest as well. See? There we go again. Now the second object we moved, and the first object was at rest. Now, after the collision, the second object is at rest. All right, so then you take two of the objects, apply to the same, coming in with equal and opposite momentums, then you get this situation where they, they each of the momentums change in the same amount, and they come out with the same, essentially the same momentum coming back out. And I guess one other comment, and if you thought it was weird that how they collided in there, then good for you paying attention to details. Um, each of those uh, carts has little magnets inside of them that are pointed in opposite directions, so they repel each other. Um, and this is one way you can ensure an elastic collision, where the optics don't actually collide, they use uh, this uh, magnetic force um, to repel each other. All right, and finally, we have inelastic collisions. And again, remember, we're only really talking about these two extreme cases. You have perfectly elastic, just like uh, solid billiard balls. Um, and then you have perfectly inelastic, which is essentially when you have two objects collide and they stick together afterwards. You can imagine there's a whole spectrum of cases in between there, but again, we're only considering sort of the extreme cases here. So it turns out in this in elastic collisions, you actually have uh, energy that's lost. But well, we haven't really talked about energy yet. We'll talk about that next lecture, so I won't worry too much about what that means right now. Um, but yeah, so some examples of car or examples of inelastic collisions are like car crashes, right, where they crumple and they stuck or stuck together, or uh, like a bug hitting a windshield. Or, you know, like that uh, bullet um, maybe burying into a steel plate. So in the case of, uh, say, uh, you know, just some basic examples of inelastic collisions, right, the momentum is still going to be conserved in these situations, right? So that's the good thing about conservation of momentum when it comes to collisions. If it's elastic, if it's inelastic, we still uh, have conservation of momentum. So in the uh, first case around the left there, you have car A and car B coming in at each other uh, with, say, uh, equal velocities and probably equal uh, masses. So they have equal amounts of momentum coming uh, towards each other, and they collide inelastically, and they crumple, and they get stuck together, and they end with at rest. Right? So not moving at all, so zero momentum. Right? So started out, zero momentum, ended zero momentum. Momentum was conserved. The final case here is when you have two objects and one's at rest and one's in motion and they collide and again inelastic they collide inelastically I mean they're gonna get stuck together you we're still gonna have a conservation conservation of momentum and again these objects have the same mass so a and b have the same amount of mass whatever it is so if you start out with a mass a moving at 10 whatever it is miles per hour or meters per second to the right, then that's a certain amount of momentum to the right. We have this collision happen, and now we still need to be moving to the right because there was momentum to the right to begin with. We got to have momentum to the right to the end. But since the mass doubled, moved from mass A to mass A and mass B, the velocity needs to be cut in half. Right? So in this inelastic collision, we still have this movement going to the left, but the speed is cut in half. But again, momentum is conserved. So let's just see some examples of that. Here you have the one object that's moving in. It collides inelastically, right? It gets stuck. This time there's a Velcro there, so they sure they get stuck together. And they both then start to move together at about half the speed. You can kind of, by eyeball, you can see it's about half the speed. Our eyes aren't very good at measuring velocity, but you can get a pretty good idea. And then now I think he's going to push them together. And if he does it with... Uh, Precisely enough so that they have the same velocity coming in, 
then they're going to have equal amounts of momentum coming in toward each other, and they just stop. So both of those are examples of inelastic collisions where the objects stuck together entirely, um, but again, the momentum in these cases is still conserved. Oh, so uh, I guess I already talked about that. Yeah, uh, cool. So that's it for um, momentum, or for now at least, about momentum. Um, next time, uh, I think it is a lecture on energy. So sort of going a bit beyond now, uh, just strict, strictly Newtonian understanding of motion, we can talk about uh, new quantities or other quantities, which we call energy, different kinds of energy. And um, basically it's just another way of analyzing or understanding motion. And in many cases, it's a much simpler way of looking at situations. Uh, have a good one, and I'll see you next time.